Good afternoon and uh, good morning from wherever you are joining us today. Um, thanks for joining this panel discussion hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAS for short. My name is Anna Weinberg, and I'm CCASTRA Adaptation Community Practice Coordinator uh, based out of the University of Arizona. As this conversation brings in many topics and different perspectives, um, as any landscape scale management conversation is bound to do, I am co-presenting today's discussion with Ariel Leji, CCAS Grasslands um, Community of Practice Coordinator, who will facilitate the Q&A session after the presentations. For those of you who are new to CCAS, CCAS supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange, uh, through case studies, webinars, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species, and trout adaptation. Today, we will be hearing from Laura Norman and Tess Wagner about the implementation and impacts of rock erosion control structures in arid and semi-arid watersheds. Dr. Laura Norman is a supervisory research physical scientist at USGS, where she has worked since 1998. Her research combines remotely sensed imagery and other geospatial data in complex hydrological, hydraulic, and land use land cover models to predict the source, fate, and transport of non-point source pollutants, consider potential growth scenarios, and document impacts of change. Tess Wagner is the Watershed Restoration Program Manager for the Borderlands Restoration Network, where she oversees wildland and working land restoration projects. Since moving to Southern Arizona in 2013, she has worked for the National Park Service, the US Forest Service, and the Pima County Regional Flood Control District, managing a variety of natural science, landscape design, and ecological restoration projects. She holds a bachelor's degree in earth system science from McGill University and a master's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Arizona. A final reminder that, as always, these presentations will be followed by a Q&A session. We strongly encourage you all to write in questions directly in the chat. Um, we'll be keeping track of these, and we'll relay them to our panelists after the presentation. Um, we'll start today with a presentation from Laura, and then Tess is calling in from Mexico currently, so I'll we'll do a little um, you know, Zoom shuffle, as always, and I'll share the slides, and Tess will um, speak to us through the phone. So with that, Laura um, and Tess, we're ready for you. Thank you, uh, Anna and Ariel, and uh, for inviting me here. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, about the work that I've been doing for the past 12 years and research that I've been doing on natural infrastructure and dryland streams that I'm calling NIDS now. <laughs> and provide an overview of the USGS Arid Land Water Harvesting Project that um, I started in 2010 when I began investigating the impacts of various rock erosion control uh, and riparian detention structures to provide quantifiable results describing their interaction with water, soils, and vegetation. Now, when I talk about these riparian detention structures, I'm referring to these um, structures you see on, on screen. These are examples of low-tech, low-cost natural infrastructure in dryland streams, whether they're made of rocks, logs, or vegetative debris. Pictured here where the blue arrows portray the direction of flow is a leaky weir, a gabion, a check dam, a one rock dam, trincheras, and a beaver dam. We began working with a consortium of local agencies in 2013 to evaluate site condition and pri prioritize areas and methods for restorative treatment that could be collaborated on to improve the success of combined efforts. We just developed a little documentary on this. If you're interested, the link is available below. The USGS Arid Lands Water Harvesting Study employs the science that's now known as ecohydrology. We focus on geomorph geomorphical and biogeochemical processes that are instigated by the hydrological cycle to enhance environmental sustainability. Our research quantifies these variables in the water budget and how they change when rock detention structures are installed. 
Now I'm going to step through some of our scientific research and describe just the results and associated ecosystem services that structures can provide that help mitigate climate risks. This example depicts the installation of rock gabions in Nogales, Sonora, where we documented the potential to reduce peak flow events by a half, regulating associated flooding downstream. Using satellite image, imagery, we documented that vegetation is maintained and improved over a 30-year time frame at Gabion structures installed by Cuenca Los Ojos and the National Wildlife Refuge in the San Bernardino watershed, despite drought conditions, and that this was evidenced extending up to five kilometers downstream and one kilometer upstream of each structure. The structures are not only retaining sediment and reducing flashy flows, but they're also helping to propagate plant growth and extend growing seasons, increasing perennial and ephemeral riparian habitat and associated biodiversity. At the Baba Kamari Ranch in the San Pedro watershed next door, we collected field measurements at Gabion structures installed by Borderlands Restoration Network that demonstrate increased soil moisture by an average of 10%. When that's woven into a larger watershed model, results depicted the potential of watershed-wide watershed Gabion installation to increase total aquifer recharge by a minimum of 4% with noted increases in subsurface connectivity and accentuated lateral flow contributions. The structures are an adaptation strategy that can be used to avert risks associated with drought and water shortages by providing increased water storage. Over at uh, the El Coronado Ranch in the Chiricahua Mountains, the Austins installed over 2,000 small check dams throughout a small watershed. We documented a decrease in peak flows and increased volumes of water by 28% compared to an adjacent system. Water was held in the system and slowly released over time. So the structures are a climate adaptation strategy that reduce flooding, but also harvest rainfall and augment water supplies, extending seasonal water availability. Using a calibrated watershed model, we estimated that approximately 210 tons of sediment was stored behind these series of check dams per year. Soil conservation is critical for plants, animals, and the water supply. In watersheds where increases in rainfall and associated stormwater runoff leads to polluted water, the prevention of sediment transport and deterring decreases water in water quality is a climate adaptation strategy. In addition, air quality is improved with increased vegetation and erosion control via the mitigation of dust storms. Based on predicted sediment storage at structures and isotope analysis of the soil sampled therein, led by Dr. James Caligari, we calculated the rate of soil carbon capture for rock detention structures at approximately 200 to 250 metric tons per hectare. That is equivalent to what is stored in wetlands. By developing and increasing carbon sequestration in dryland environments, NIDS help mitigate the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You may already know this, but rock detention structures are not a new technology. Indigenous communities in the southwestern United States and Mexico have used rock dams to avert food insecurity by growing crops, controlling erosion, and flooding for millennia. Archaeologists have identified rock detention structures here in Tucson where Hohokam people have used structures to help them grow agave for food and alcohol, some dating back to 1500 BC. Relating to climate, we tested structures installed by natural channel design in one of the hottest cities in the United States, in Phoenix, Arizona, in a study led by Deborah Taslin with the Bureau of Reclamation. The models show decreases in peak flows and increases in infiltration at structures like the Gabion studies portrayed in the previous slides. And monitoring depicted a three degree microclimate cooling effect for at least two days following rainfall events at treated sites. 
Impacts of urban heat islands create an average of about that exact same three degrees heating effect in Phoenix. NIDS can help address risks of heat waves being felt in arid and semi-arid environments. Rock detention structures can serve, restore, and engineer with nature for the benefits of people and nature. The benefits defined here as ecosystem services. Natural infrastructure can be placed throughout a dryland stream watershed and strategically situated to alleviate flooding, erosion, and sediment transport, create habitat, sequester carbon, grow food, and also to help communities adapt to changing climates. This is an ecosystem-based approach to climate change adaptation and mitigation that is supported by science and helps reduce risk to climate-related disturbances. So here's a little diagram to portray the natural processes leading to degradation. And please forgive my artwork, but exposed soils that are being uh, shown there on the, on the left slide um, promote rainwater, rainwater runoff before it can soak in, leading to flooding downstream. Bare soil is hot, raising temperatures and causing water to evaporate, and these processes are cyclical. Runoff causes erosion, which further reduces vegetation, causing desert desertification, flooding, and water quality issues. However, this cyclical feedback can be reversed and systems can be rehydrated. Rock structures can retain sediments and reduce erosional forces. They can detain water long enough to soak into the soil, distributing it throughout the landscape and allowing vegetation to take root. A little water transpires through the plants and all the senesced material stays put, building fertile, nutrient-rich soil banks. Over time, enough water can accumulate to support lateral flows and percolate into groundwater. Soil remains moist year round, roots and biomass flourish, and cooling moisture and humidity can form clouds overhead. If you didn't like my drawings, here's some actual photographs of a paired watershed study site that portray the same impacts. These photos show a control site with bare ground and bedrock, large cobble, deep gullying, and exposed roots. This system is losing water and carbon. The adjacent watershed treated with rock structures depicts a lusher, greener channel with no exposed bedrock or roots, but instead you can see the soil water carbon sinks that support vegetation in the channel, their root systems, and their seasonality. This system is sequestering carbon and storing water for extended use. These check dams contain deep, rich sediment loads and stepped pools that promote productivity of riparian vegetation and longevity of growth that would not otherwise be there. Rock detention structures are effectively creating coveted freshwater wetlands, distinct ecosystems flooded by water. In arid lands, we call these cienegas. Some by restoring the historic cienegas, but others are altering the state of riparian channels to create new wetland-like ecosystems. Based on density and prices of check dam installation from the watershed I just shared photos from, I extrapolated across the 33,182 hectares of federal and tribal riparian areas to calculate the number of structures and the cost to install them. It would cost $73 million to install 86,000 of these infrastructure for climate resilience. For comparison, Arizona spurred legislation of $100 million last year alone for climate-related disaster recovery. Now, the benefits of installing these are great. These structures can sequester 7.5 million tons of atmospheric carbon in soil storage, maintain or increase vegetation and biomass with extended growing seasons that further increase 
the sequestration, extend ephemeral duration and surface water for plants and wildlife in the forest, mitigate floods and associated emergency response expenditures to recover roads and campsites, promote lateral flows and on-site storage of water for potable supply, control erosion and non-point source pollution, improving water quality, and reduce ambient temperatures. In addition, over 1,000 job years and over $160 million of economic output would be received by local, regional, and national economies. Now, I know you're all sitting there wondering, what about the beaver? She said she was gonna talk about the beavers. Well, beavers are nature's engineers who by damming streams also create and enhance nutrient-rich waterlogged wetland habitats. And again, this isn't new nor untested. In fact, beaver paratroopers were actually launched by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game as outpost agents of flood control and soil conservation in 1950. Agencies like the Watershed Management Group here in Tucson are reintroducing beavers into, into strategic locations for the benefit of wildlife and fisheries and local water users. And they're making great strides establishing themselves in their dams and lodges up and down the river. The USGS Arid Land Water Harvesting Study are partnering with Watershed Management Group to try to document these impacts. While I've only seen a few of these structures in Arizona, I got together with some colleagues from around the country who are experts in their fields of soils carbon, geosciences, environmental science, geomorphology, and ecosystem analysis related to beaver dams, their analogs, and riparian detention structures in watersheds and fluvial systems to look at all the studies we have done collectively that are mapped out here. And we compared notes from decades of their research on soils, structures, and beaver dams to the results from the USGS Arid Land Water Harvesting Study, finding consistent similarities regarding the hydrogeomorphic and biogeochemical processes and wetland outputs all of these natural infrastructure have. Here is our list for literature review describing climate adaptation and mitigation services and scientific research for each of the natural infrastructure and violence streams or NIDS. We began to understand that all of the detention structures or NIDS were invoking processes in arid and semi-arid fluvial environments that can restore degraded and arid aridifying landscapes. Restoration of dry landscapes is dependent on rainwater detention and the recovery of permanent vegetation that can have a direct role in cooling, reducing temperatures and air pressure gradients. Focusing restoration on these processes, NIDS can restore shifts from the focus from what type of structures are you talking about to employing process-based restoration that ignites regenerative processes. We documented the ability of NIDS to facilitate in restoring or creating new soil water carbon sinks, also known as wetlands. Where structures are installed, clear water runs steadily through and step pool conveyance. Loads and tons of healthy soil is retained and stored behind NIDS with deposition filling up gullies. If you dig down behind them, you'll see more deep organic soils that can draw carbon down. As time goes by, feedback cycles promote sustainability, the bioproductivity of this captured soil increases, vegetation takes root where it wouldn't have otherwise, and the deep soil allows for deeper roots to grow. The drawdown of carbon exponentially increases. The soil sponge that is created is available for infiltrating and detaining water weeks to months longer than it would be otherwise to sustain living plant growth, increase the availability of nutrients and extend growing seasons. We documented rates of soil carbon storage in NIDS that not only compared to wetland environments, but could exceed the most carbon rich among the forest ecosystems, estuarian mangrove wetlands due to their ability to store carbon underground. In addition, research looking at beaver developed wetlands with green lush plants persistent during drought portrayed increased resilience to wildfire. 
This is something that we had noted when the Horseshoe 2 fire burned the Chiricahua Mountains, but skirted around the watershed that had been treated with structures. When a fire ignites, that green wetland vegetation near the NIDS will be more difficult to burn than other nearby dry vegetation. The fire will often take the path of least resistance and burn through the dry vegetation away from ponds instead of smoldering through the wet vegetation near NIDS. All of the slides I have presented depicting USGS research of rock detention structures are readily matched in studies supporting the exact same findings from beaver dams and their analogs. NIDS are nature-based solutions that mitigate drought, water shortage, flooding, heat waves or dust storms, wildfire, biodiversity losses, and food insecurity. NIDS create wetlands and wetlands help mitigate hazards. They're able to deflect risk and also absorb disturbances by restoring to pre-disturbance conditions faster. Of course, there's no silver bullet for watershed restoration, and we have documented some of those caveats associated with successful restoration using NIDS, including maintenance, site and scale dependent planning, the need for abundance of structures, and trained practitioners like our next speaker to install them. Working with our partners in the Sky Island Restoration Collaborative, we also documented the importance of land and water managers, restoration practitioners, and the scientific community working together for truly successful project implementation. In celebration of Earth Day last month, I watched the White House Roundtable on Knowledge and Nature. The event highlighted new Biden-Harris administration initiatives for bipartisan infrastructure law and my boss's commitment to ecosystem restoration and nature-based solutions to fight the impacts of climate change. Beaver dams, their analogs, and various types of rock, wood, and debris detention structures are natural infrastructure and dryland streams, NIDS. They are nature-based solution to mitigate climate-related risk and rejuvenate water and carbon cycles. NIDS can restore or create new wetlands in arid riparian areas that reverse desertification and strengthen climate resilience. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Laura. Um, I'm sure tons of folks have questions and we're gonna keep it rolling. Um, to test. So give me one moment and I will pull up Tess's presentation. All right, Tess, um, the presentation is up and I'm ready for you whenever you are. All right, uh, thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize. I had some connectivity issues this morning, uh, so I'm calling in. Um, you can't see my face, but it's okay. There's slides to look at. Um, so yeah, my name is Tess Wagner, and I manage the Watershed Restoration Program uh, for Borderlands Restoration Network. Um, and thank you all so much for coming. I always love to talk restoration with people, um, and it's, it's really exciting to present with Laura Norman as well, uh, because her research uh, really validates a lot of the on-the-ground work that we do, um, and it's, you know, really important for uh, a lot of our funders to, to recognize the importance of our work. So, yeah, it's, it's exciting to be here with you all and to present with Laura. Um, next slide. So uh, today I'll start with talking about the organization I work for, a little bit about who we are and our program areas. Um, then I'll talk about erosion and land use change uh, and kind of set the stage and provide some background for uh, the issues that uh, uh, our organization is trying to address um, with the work that we do with the, the rock work and that sort of thing. Um, and then I'll go into watershed restoration, so how we mitigate those problems. Um, and then finally, um, we'll have some questions at the end, if you have any. Uh, next slide. 
So Borderlands Restoration Network, uh, we partner to grow a restorative economy by rebuilding healthy ecosystems, restoring habitat for plants and wildlife, and reconnecting our border communities to the land through shared learning. Um, so we are a restoration nonprofit based in the small border town of Patagonia, Arizona. And we have, uh, so we focus on landscape restoration and ecological restoration, but we do it through a uh, very holistic approach. Um, so this approach can be described pretty well through our three program areas. So first we have our education program area, um, and they do all sorts of different workshops and outreach events and trainings. Um, that really focus on uh, giving people information about the landscapes that they live in, how to care for the landscapes they live in, and that sort of thing. Um, we also have our Native Plant Materials Program. So this program, uh, we have a native plant nursery in Patagonia with five greenhouses and about 10,000 plants. Um, so this program produces all of our plant material that we use for restoration. Um, and the plants are restoration quality, so meaning they're very hardy. They're, um, you know, meant to be plants that you can put out in the landscape that don't need irrigation. Um, and then our Native Plant Materials Program also does all of our seed collection, seed cleaning, and seed preparation. Um, and then finally, we have the Watershed Restoration Program, which is the program I manage. And that program, so we do all the on-the-ground restoration. Um, so we use the plants from the nursery. Um, we put them in the ground, figure out where they're going to go. Um, and then we also do a lot of erosion control, a little bit of invasive plant control as well. Um, so these are the three program areas. And there's a lot of overlap between the three of them. Um, and we all work very closely together. Um, to kind of knit all of these program areas together in, in the way that we do restoration. Uh, next slide. So now I'm going to move on. I'm going to, as I mentioned, kind of set the stage for uh, what, why the restoration work we do is important and what we're really trying to do with restoration work. Um, next slide. So I want to start by saying that um, erosion is a very natural landscape forming process. Um, so erosion is the uh, transport of material, basically weathering is the breakdown of the rocky material of our planet. And then erosion is the transportation of that material around our, uh, around the globe. Um, and this, this is really a critical um, process that forms our landscape. So erosion on, it, on its own is not, it's not a bad process. Uh, next slide. Um, so this, of course, is the Grand Canyon, um, created very much by erosion. Um, so erosion creates some of our most stunning and dynamic landscapes. Um, and I'd also like to point out that it, um, without human intervention, erosion occurs on a very slow time scale, so uh, a geologic time scale, right? Because um, erosion is caused by, um, you know, uh, water or wind to a lesser extent. You know, if you're in somewhere like Arches National Park, uh, a lot of those rock formations were formed by wind erosion. Um, but where we are, we're really focused on water erosion. Um, and that can be seen like this in the Grand Canyon. Uh, so the Grand Canyon, of course, was carved by water. And it took, you know, five or six million years for water to, to wind its way down the canyon and really carve that landscape. Um, and in doing so, uh, with erosion, we also get, um, not only does it shape our landscapes, but it also gives us um, a variety of different microclimates, a variety of different niches for, for wildlife and ecology to thrive and evolve. Um, so if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon uh, and you've been at the top and then made your way down to the bottom, uh, the temperature is very different, the humidity is very different, very different species you'll find at the top and the bottom. So, um, yeah, erosion is really a critical piece of forming our landscapes. Uh, next slide. Um, of course, uh, then you look at uh, things like, like these you know, um, that, that humans have done to our landscape. So the border wall, uh, mining, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and, and human development, um, basically interventions like these that humans have caused They've led to unprecedented, extremely rapid, novel, and large-scale disturbances to our landscapes. Um, so disturbances on a scale that are just um, um, accelerating Earth, Earth system processes much faster than they would occur normally. 
Um, next slide. So here's another example. This is Tucson um, of how uh, humans have modified um, our landscape. So um, at least 70% of Earth's land has been altered by humans. Um, and that's probably a pretty um, conservative estimate. Um, so, so, you know, you think about oh, that's a really, really massive amount of land. Um, and you start to think, um, okay, how does this, all these alterations that we're making so quickly um, and so drastically, what does this really cause? Um, and so uh, next slide. Um, so I want to point out, so again, this is ranching, another alteration to our landscape. Um, and although land use change can take many, many forms, so I've just shown you a few, urbanization, agriculture, ranching, mining, um, each of these types of land use change do have some characteristics in common, which I want to point out. Um, so next, next slide. So um, some characteristics um, that are caused by land use change um, include, first of all, decreased vegetation cover, because um, you know we're removing vegetation to put in a city, to put in agriculture, you know whatever it may be, to put in a road. Um, and with that, with that um, uh, decrease in vegetation cover, you get destabilized soils, uh, because vegetation is really what holds our soils in place. Um, especially in these, these arid landscapes, um, it's it's a really you know with um, heat topography and mountains, um, vegetation is critical in holding our landscape together. So once you remove that, the soil becomes a lot looser and easy to erode. Um, at the same time, you get decreased infiltration uh, because plant again plant roots they they help to aerate the soil, make sure that it has floor spaces in it for water to infiltrate into. Additionally, plant roots um, suck up water. You know, as water comes into the soil, plant roots suck it up and actually hold it in their little, their plant bodies and, and so hold water in the landscape that way. So when you remove vegetation, you remove that, you know, that the plants that are actually uh, drawing water uh, into the landscape and storing it there. Um, and this is particularly important in arid landscapes. Um, because, you know, we, you look at our temperature, re or not temperature, sorry, precipitation regime here. Um, we get uh, the majority of our rain, or about half our rain in monsoon season. Then we have a um, lesser rain season in the winter, especially lesser now with um, climate change. But um, uh, basically, the, the vegetation here has adapted to, you know, go, go long periods without water. Uh, so when water comes, our, our plants are very good at sucking it up very quickly. So you remove that vegetation, you remove that, that whole um, process of storing water in the landscape. Um, additionally, with this decrease in vegetative cover, um, runoff volumes really um, increase in both volume and velocity. Um, so, so they become much quicker uh, due to the physical, um, the physical way that plants can inhibit the flow of water. So if you you know, imagine a slope with a bunch of plants on it. Uh, the plants are going to physically stop that water and slow it down and kind of guide it uh, down the down the slope. If you remove those plants, all of a sudden you're just going to have um, very fast uh, sheet flow that's gaining speed and not being slowed down by anything physical in its way. So very um, very quick moving water. Um, you also have increased flow volumes because, as I mentioned, you don't have um, the infiltration into the soil, the plants taking, or the, yeah, the infiltration into the soil and the plants taking up the water that you would um, if you had if you had vegetation. Um, so next slide. So all of these things combined together, uh, these lead to drastically increased erosion rates. Um, and when you're talking about increasing erosion rates, you're essentially talking about increasing the physical loss of our landscape. Um, and once you start to get this uh, increased erosion, it can be very, very hard to stop it. Even if you remove whatever disturbance source is causing that that um, that, that increased erosion to take place. Um, so that's where um, so that's when it uh, that's where we come in. Um, next slide. So that's where watershed restoration comes in, um, and that's really what kind of where we start all our restoration projects um, is thinking about, okay, how do we restore the flow of water across our landscape? 
Um, and when, uh, uh, another thing I want to point out is when you're talking about restoring how water moves through a landscape, you're really talking about resource flow through a landscape. Um, so not just water, but you're talking about um, you're talking about how um, different uh, you're talking about how energy moves through a landscape, how wildlife moves through a landscape, especially again in arid areas where a lot of our wildlife. Um, you know, uh, 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 they travel along our riparian corridors. Um, so you're really talking about if you can mitigate how water moves across our landscape, if you can restore how water flows through our landscape, you're restoring um, the trans. Uh, you're restoring how sediment moves, how water moves, how wildlife moves, how energy moves. There's so much tied to that because water is really a proxy for how how uh, a number of, of of pieces of our landscape uh, kind of flow through them. Um, next slide, please. So um, why do we focus on the watershed? Um, so maybe that, that might be a little bit, uh, that might be intuitive based on how much I've been talking about water and water flow. But um, basically, we really focus on the, at the watershed scale because that's the hydrologic, that's a hydrologically connected area. Um, so if we want to restore how water flows, you know, we have to look at a scale um, it's basically the water scale, uh, and we have to look at all those pieces um, that are connected by the flow of water. Um, so that's why we really start with the watershed. Uh, next slide. And then, so the other piece of watershed restoration is, of course, restoration. Um, and maybe that term seems rather obvious, what it means, but, but I did want to just mention kind of how we define it, because sometimes... Um, Sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to think of restoration as kind of going backwards or uh, going back to a particular state in time and trying to replicate um, exactly what was, um, you know, happening um, in a landscape at a particular time. Uh, next slide. But the problem with, uh, with thinking about restoration this way is, first of all, our landscapes are incredibly dynamic. So, uh, it, you know, you would have to choose a very particular point in time to replicate and um, you know how would you you know what what point do you really choose um, that that's sort of hard that's sort of nebulous and hard to define um, another problem is if you're just talking about structure so restoring um, the, the pieces of the landscape and how they fit together if you're just talking about that and not addressing function um, your restoration isn't going to last because if you just put um, you know, some plants in the ground, um, and you don't first mitigate the flow volumes. Um, these are plants that aren't adapted to establish with these, you know, really high flow volumes and velocities. Um, so first, you really need to start um, by addressing the function within a landscape, addressing how water moves through the landscape. Um, so that's where we really start. We start with that restoration of water flow through a landscape. And then we can get on to focusing more on the structure of the landscape. So things like uh, revegetation um, and that sort of thing. Um, next slide. So um, now I'm going to uh, shift over and start talking about some of the projects we have. So um, these red dots, you can see these are the areas that uh, the Watershed Restoration Program works. Um, one area that's actually not shown here, the Borderlands Wildlife Preserve in yellow, we're working there as well. Um, so you can see Patagonia. Um, all these areas are within about an hour and a half of Patagonia. Um, and they're funded by a variety of different uh, sources. And they're a variety of different types of land. So we, you work on Forest Service land, as you can see in our Huachuca project and the Smith and Stevens Canyon project. Um, we do work on private ranches as well. So the T4 Ranch, you can see that's a private, a private ranch. Uh, Pyatt Ranch is actually an interesting one, and we're just about to get started on that. We're waiting for the funding to come through, but that one's actually half on Forest Service land and half on private land, um, which is actually sometimes it can be very hard to um, to make those projects work. Um, with land ownership because, um, you know, we, we have these sort of, when you're looking at the watershed scale, we have these kind of arbitrary landscape uh, definitions and boundaries, you know, property boundaries. Um, and sometimes we're forced to work within those, which can make, which can make our task um, 
a lot more difficult. But for private ranch, we're, we're able to work um, on both, uh, both uh, public and private land, which is pretty cool. Um, and these projects, we have an assortment of funding, funding sources as well. So we're primarily, we're about 75% um, uh, grant funded. Um, so all of these projects here are grants. Uh, the Wachupa Project is jointly funded by Quail Forever and the National Forest Foundation. Piat Ranch were actually contracted through the Arizona Land and Water Trust to do that one. Smith and Stevens Canyon, that's funded by the Wildlife Conservation Society. And then T4 Ranch is funded by the Arizona Department of Water Resources. So we have a number of partners um, um, associated with these projects, which is really awesome. Uh, next slide. So I just wanted to point out, you know, I'm talking about the importance of uh, working, um, paying attention to the, you know, the watershed and what's going on there. So I just wanted to uh, point out how our projects tie into um, the sub watershed and major watersheds of the of the region. Um, so we do work. You can see um, on the, on the left of the map these uh, sub watersheds in dark blue all drain into the Santa Cruz River. Um, and then on the on the east, all of those drain into the uh, San Pedro River. So we are working in two very important um, and very major um, watersheds in the in southern Arizona. Um, next slide. All right. So this is a zoom in of that that little orange or was it yellow? I think it was yellowish orange on the previous slide. The Borderlands Wildlife Preserve, which is a preserve that we co-manage. Um, and what I, I kind of wanted to go over here is, um, okay, so we're interested in the watershed scale, but, but where do we start? We have our watershed, but where do we start in the watershed? Um, so I pointed out here a few canyons, Smith Stevens and Little Casablanca, all these canyons drain into Sonoya Creek, which then um, drains into the Patagonia Lake, where it, there's a dam there, but then ultimately um, goes on to the Santa Cruz uh, River. Um, so next slide. So basically, when we're when I'm figuring out, you know, where to start a restoration project, um, uh, we always start at the top of the watershed and follow the direct direction of water flow. And the reason for this is that it's so much easier to address issues just as they're starting, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, trying to address something in the middle of the watershed where you've already got. Uh, you know, you've already got all this momentum that water has gained um, as it's traveled, you know, across the landscape. So we always, always start at the top of the watershed, um, and we work our way down. And our structures at the top, you know, they're they're pretty small, and uh, you know, they're just there's just a few rocks. Sometimes they may not look like they're doing much, but you put a few hundred of them in, and they they start to have some pretty profound influence on. On um, the reduction of erosion and on how water moves through the landscape. Um, next slide, please. So now that we figured out where to start, um, how do we go about restoring those those flows of water? So um, uh, we build erosion control uh, erosion control structures. Um, so these have there are several different types of structures we build, which I'll go into in a minute. And they have several different, um, depending on the structure and, and how we build them, they can have different impacts or, or multiple impacts. So one thing we, we do is just we want to stop problematic erosion. Um, so things like head cuts, uh, those we focus on just stopping erosion, stopping the migration of the head cuts. Uh, we also want to slow and infiltrate water. Um, so again, remember you remove plants, all of a sudden you have increased flow velocities and volumes. So we want to slow down that water give it a chance to pool and give it a chance to infiltrate into the ground. Um, and also that really helps reduce its erosive power. Um, and then we also want to trap sediment and organic material to rebuild our soils because um, soil, uh, soil erosion, um, well, we need soils to have um, healthy plants. So we want to restore our soils as well. Uh, next slide. So these are some details about the erosion control structures we build. So uni bowls, these are the most technical structure we build. They're really fun, uh, but they do take they do take a little bit more skill and technique than the other ones. Um, and these we, we typically put at head cuts to stop that head cut from migrating, or we put it at a nick point where a head cut's starting to form. 
And those just, uh, you know, stop erosion. We do a lot of these one rack dams as well. This is the one rack dams are really the bread and butter of what we do. We do we do mostly those. And those we do, so we, we build those uh, perpendicular to the flow of water um, in channel. Um, and we'll do, you know, hundreds of them down a drainage. Um, and again, you know, each one on its own really doesn't do that much, but, but you start to do a couple hundred, a few hundred, you treat many drainages or many tributaries that are coming into one drainage, and all of a sudden you, you get to see some real impact. Um, we also do medialinas, which are structures that uh, basically control sheet flow. Um, so these don't go in a channel, but they're similar to a one rock dam. Um, and we put we can put medialinas in a number of areas, but one place that we put them is uh, directly upstream of Zuni Bowl to just slow down that water as it's entering this area where there were previous erosive issues. Um, and then for so this hybrid log, log rock structure, this is basically a one rock dam, but just with a log in it. And the reason uh, that we do these is basically we, we try to use um, native material, whatever's on the landscape, whenever we can to avoid importing rock. Um, so some of our sites have a lot more down and dead wood available than they do rock. So we just kind of use what we can find. Um, and sometimes we use wood and put them into our structures. Next slide. So that's really where we start is with the erosion control, with the, the um, restoring how water moves through a landscape. Uh, but there are other things we can do too. So we also do some um, exotic invasive vegetation removal. And actually more and more we're contracting this work out to the Tucson Audubon Society because they have, this is kind of their specialty in restoration. Um, they're really good. They have a great team for exotic invasive uh, plant control. So they do a lot of our work, but we do, we still do some, um, and we really, you know, we really target um, exotic invasive species because there are a lot of them, and some of them are, um, well, kind of unrealistic that, that you know, um, we could ever really get rid of them, so we really do a targeted approach and think about, okay, what are our goals, what, what can we really manage, um, and, and what areas can, you know, once we get the vegetation out, what do we want it to look out, look like, um, and how do we, you know, restore it with native plant communities? Um, and then sort of, uh, next slide. Um, so then, of course, you know, after we get in the rock structures, after we maybe do a little bit invasive plant control, we focus on revegetation. Um, so we really want to reestablish and enhance degraded habitat, increase biological richness, um, and then plants also work very synergistically with the rock structures we put in. Um, because remember how I was saying, you know, the plant roots really stabilize the soil. They, pull, they hold water in the landscape. So really, you know, once we get those rock structures that kind of help slow the flow of water, help mitigate it a little, then we can get the plants in there to really also do that work as well. Um, so they, they really work very well together, uh, plants and this erosion control. Um, next slide. So um, then the revegetation techniques that we use, so of course we do outplanting, we use plants from our native plant nursery, and then we also do seed pellets. So seed pellets are native wild harvested seed that has been cleaned and then mixed in a cement mixer, a little cement mixer with, um, let's see, clay, diatomaceous earth, compost, and water. And basically you mix all these things together in the right ratios and you get these little pellets. Um, and then we can just sprinkle them out in the landscape. And we always put these out in conjunction with our erosion control structures to kind of jumpstart that revegetation. And a reason that we do seed pellets is because uh, they really cut back on predation. So um, we can put these out any time of year. And then once the rain comes, it dissolves the seed pellets and the, the plants are allowed to germinate. So um, yeah, that's a, that's one of our main revegetation techniques that we use um, that uh, allows us to put seeds out pretty much any time of year, which is good because you know we have grants that are ending kind of all the time, uh, and you know if we need to get some seed out before a grant ends, uh, sometimes it's not you know in the monsoon season or the, the best time for that seed to germinate. So if we can get it out and pellet it and just you know let it sit for four or six months, whatever. Um, that's totally fine and a lot more uh, useful than just putting out naked seed that is very tasty to rodents, birds, insects, that sort of thing. 
Um, next slide. So finally, um, kind of the final piece of the restoration we do is the people part. Um, and, kind of, and, and redefining how we ourselves as people, but also our communities, um, really interact with our landscapes, understand our landscapes, and how we relate to our landscapes. Um, so we really want to reintegrate individuals and communities as a functional component of our landscapes. Um, and we do this through, so this is where our education program, you know, becomes really important. So we do it through education um, and paid work. One of our um, kind of longest running programs is the Borderlands Earth Care Youth Program, or BESI, um, which is a program, a six-week program during the summer for local youth, specifically local youth, uh, high school students in both Patagonia and Douglas. So these are two small border communities, pretty rural. Um, and both of these communities have, uh, as are, have some characteristics that are typical to rural communities in this area. Um, and that is that they, the industries um, and jobs available to the um, to people in these communities tend to be very extractive. So there's jobs in mining and jobs in ranching, both of which are you know, all about extracting from the landscape um, and not at all about, you know, taking care of the landscape. Um, so through this um, youth program, we're, we really hope to, um, you know, first of all, give, provide youth uh, a paid opportunity that where they can make some money, um, but also an opportunity to kind of think about other ways to relate to the landscape. So they get to work on all sorts of different restoration projects. Some, uh, they, they come out for a few weeks with me and my crew and we do some wildland restoration. Uh, they do some in-community projects uh, with rainwater harvesting and, and um, installing gardens. Um, so they get to do all sorts of things, but just kind of this very, um, this very uh, productive and um, restorational um, approach and relationship that they're building with the earth. Um, and then, of course, we also do volunteer opportunities. So we always love to have people out with us um, talking restoration, learning how to do the things we do, um, uh, and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, um, community is uh, bringing community into the restoration process is also really important for us and, and critical for, you know, the on for the ongoing uh, for our work to be ongoing. Um, next step, uh, next slide. So, um, kind of in conclusion. Um, so, first of all, um, you know, we start with um, a rebuilding function in the landscape, but that's not where it starts. Where it ends. Um, it, our, our restoration approach is really about restoring our individual and community ties to the places we live as well um, and redefining our relationship to the earth. Um, and this is something that isn't a new idea. Um, so prior to colonization um, here and elsewhere in the world, um, indigenous communities were um, very, uh, uh, they built structures rather similar to what we're doing now maybe for different purposes. A lot of times they would uh, build uh, these rock structures for um, agricultural purposes and terracing and that sort of thing. Um, but this isn't a new, you know, this isn't a new idea that, that we've come up with. Um, it's kind of a, a redefining of, of perhaps some of these um, indigenous techniques. But, um, but yeah, uh, um, yeah, basically, we, we, we hope that we can uh, redefine these relationships and coexist with the places we live in a more healthy uh, and more conscious way. Um, next slide. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, thank you all so much for listening to me ramble about restoration for the past 20, 30 minutes. Um, and yeah, if there are any questions or thoughts or anything, I would love to hear them. Thanks a lot, Tess, and thank you, Laura. Um, great presentations, both of you. Really appreciate it. And thanks everybody for sticking around and staying staying with us for this hour. We're gonna um, take some time to address some of the questions that people have been asking, both before the webinar and and during this webinar. And um, it seems like they fall into four categories that I think we can use to to structure this discussion. Um, the first would be about implementation. 
there are a lot of questions that people have about how to implement, where to place these structures on the landscape, how many to place, those sort of things. Um, and I know that there are, there's a lot of experience in this room and a lot of resources that people have. If you have access to some of these resources, whether they're PDFs or, or other videos, whatever it may be, I'd encourage folks to drop those directly into the chat and or email them to me later on. After these webinars, um, something that I like to do is produce a little summary for everybody along with the recording that includes things that went to the chat that you can't see just through the YouTube page. So whether that's right now or later on, please send me any of those, those resources so that I can help spread, spread the word about these, um, these sort of interventions uh, to reduce erosion. So back to what I was saying, there's sort of four categories, implementation, um, maintenance, regulation, and then quantifying impacts of these structures. And I think we can sort of structure our discussion there. Um, and before we jump into some of these questions, I'll just give everybody maybe 30 seconds to, to type any questions that you have into the chat. Take a little moment to think about the presentations you just heard um, and, and add anything that you want to, to discuss or add it um, address directly to one of the speakers today um, into that chat. So I'll give folks a second right now. All right, keep those questions coming in the chat if you're typing anything. Um, and as you write those in, I think the first place to start is about implementation. So this could really be for, um, for both Tess and Laura. It seems like there were a few questions today uh, specifically about how many structures to place on the landscape and where to place them. And I know that that's a, a large question and will depend on context. But if there's any any insight that either of y'all have about the number of structures, Tess, you said that that sometimes y'all will in include hundreds along a drainage. But maybe for people who are thinking about implementing these, if there's a minimum amount or you know so, some sort of helpful guidance that you can give uh, to folks about the number of structures that you you place on the landscape. Yeah, for sure. So um, typically. Number is actually something that we don't, that I don't really focus too much on. Um, but how, that is, a, that is a really good question. Kind of how do you place them? Where do you place them? So um, how many you put in a drainage really depends on the geometry of the drainage and in particular, the slope of the drainage. So typically how we, kind of a good rule of thumb is your, so you start at the top of the watershed, right? So you build your upstream structure. Um, then where do you build your next structure? So basically you walk downstream, you kind of eyeball the first one and you see where the, the bottom of the first structure is. So where the structure meets the channel, um, where that, that uh, meeting is at the bottom of that structure, that's basically where you want the top of your next structure to be. Um, so that really, you know, it depends on the size of rocks you have. If you have, you know, like much larger rocks, then of course your your structures are going to be taller, so you can go more distance. Um, if you have a steep channel, then you know your your structures are going to be closer together. Um, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of a that's how we um, go about placing structures um, or the the one rock dams. Um, for other types of structures, so for the zuni bowls, we pretty much do that whenever we have a head cut that's at a scale that we can manage with this type of work. Um, and that's a little bit, that's something that, that you just kind of get an eye for with trial or error. Um, the biggest zuni goal that we've functionally done is about mm, maybe 20 feet across. Um, but typically they're, they're a little smaller than that, but we can certainly do them on that scale. But it, I mean, again, it really depends on kind of what your water flow is like. Um, if you have, um, you know, if you have really high flow volumes and velocities that you can't, 
that maybe you don't have access to mitigate upstream, maybe you don't have access to the land, maybe it's owned by someone else, um, then that can really affect kind of the, the effectiveness of these structures. Um, also, like, uh, scale is also very important for the, the one rock dams as well. So these are, so when we start with, when we do these projects, these aren't projects that we're doing in, um, you know, something like uh, the San Pedro River or large drainages. Um, they're really um, generally kind of how I, if, if I see riparian vegetation, like real riparian vegetation, things like cottonwoods, um, sycamores, anything like that, generally that's on a scale that's a little bit too large um, for, for these one-rock dams. Um, they're just going to blow out. Um, so that's why, I mean, that's another focus for us really focusing in the top of the watershed. That's where these structures are the most effective. Um, there are some exceptions, like we've done some work at Las Cienegas where there's cottonwoods that have been pretty effective. Um, but these, just the, the, the system we're working at at Las Cienegas um, over near Sonoida, um, it's an area that it has cottonwoods, but the, the groundwater levels, they're really struggling with recruitment because groundwater levels have dropped. So it's a system that's becoming much less wet. That's not really, um, you know, as robust as it used to be. Um, but yeah, I will um, stop rambling now, but hopefully that um, helped answer that. Thanks. Pat. Yeah, I could add a little bit to that, um, taking it from uh, another angle in uh, watershed management and using um, watershed models are, are valuable to look at um, the site that you're look that you're considering doing restoration on and considering your goals, you know, in, in trying to do restoration, like, are you trying to um, restore gullies or are you trying to increase habitat or are you trying to increase recharge or, you know, so, so really a lot of the, the structure implementation has to be based on the goal that you're doing. And, um, you know, we use watershed models uh, to look at um, the potential flows that might be coming through. So looking at your peak flow rate, that the amount of discharge the structure might need to be able to handle and um, the amount of sediment that might occur at that location. We've used models to identify where breaches in structures might occur. And, and so, uh, you know, applying some of that, those are, you know, this is just, you know, an automated um, version of some very old school um, uh, practices, best management practices that are, are developed and employed by the FAO. So there's, you know, gully rehabilitation handbooks from 40 years ago that describe uh, the, the, the number of check dams per slope and, you know, these kind of uh, back of the envelope calculations that you can do uh, with just a little bit of, of surveying uh, on site. Um, but, you know, the, the idea of, of using these, these kind of mathematical and scientific applications is really most valuable when you also have somebody that actually does restoration uh, in, in, their, in their history, because um, you know, they can, as Tess is describing, looking at the landscape, she's able to see things that, that, uh, that you might not be able to see without some training. So, so combining, uh, you know, those kind of things and, and in, in, in areas where, you know, the San Pedro River, for example, we, the, the structures that, uh, larger structures that, that have been put in Nogales and also put in at San Bernardino are, are put into those very high flowing and, and big, big systems and 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 there's some failure which which we can talk about but um there is also a lot of success so um yeah that just depends on on where you're putting the structures in what size how many but in the el coronado uh ranch where uh the 2000 check dams were put into uh 769 hectare watershed um, if I use the, the FAO calculations to, to quantify the amount of structures that, that should have been put in there based on that, that, that number is about 166 check dams for the five kilometers of, of length and the 550 meters of elevation change. So at that location, uh, the Austin's put in about 12 times the recommended um, number of structures. So 
Uh, again, though, this is all completely site dependent and goal dependent, but um, those are some numbers to consider. Thanks, Laura. That's really helpful. And I like what you said there, but the sort of complementary, the complementarity of the, the two approaches of having this really analytical quantitative models and just the experience on the ground and seeing what the landscape looks like. Um, and maybe you can provide some of those. I don't know how universally accessible or usable those models are, but we'd love to share some of those with folks who, who would be interested. And I saw you just posted the FAO guide. We'll definitely share that as well. Yeah, the complement, the complementing with the land managers, you know, what is their goal, the restoration practitioners, I might put something here, and then, uh, you know, doing some scientific analysis or what, what might be the impacts of restoration here, um, using the models. So, so the, you know, the three kind of parties hand in hand. Yeah, thank you. And I think that, that that sort of dovetails really nicely into another question that um, Quentin Hayes asked about the use of these sort of detention structures in ephemeral drainages where there are already earth tanks that have been built and are part of a livestock or a ranching operation. Um, Quentin said that there, there's the concern that large precipitation events um, during those large precipitation events, if one of those structures fail, they can either fill in one of the tanks or damage some of the tanks and the existing infrastructure that's there. Um, and I'm wondering either Tess or Laura, or anybody else who has experience with that, this seems like a really, um, a really good sort of, uh, what am I trying to say? I think that Quinton's question gets to one of the cruxes of these problems of like on the landscape in application when you're trying to marry multiple objectives, right? There's already earth and tanks. You're trying to run a livestock operation and trying to restore watershed function. It can get really complicated. So um, maybe Laura first, then, then Tess, if you want to jump in and anybody else who has experience or some, some insight into the um, installing these structures uh, in a complementary way to where livestock operations already exist and maintaining some of that livestock infrastructure. So I can speak a little bit to that. Um, you know, I, the, the project that we did at Nogales, Sonora was a flood detention study. And uh, the idea was to put structures in to decrease flooding downstream. My role in that was to quantify the uh, amount of water that might, um, might be de detained at the structures and um, and to, to give some understanding of, of, of what events might occur that would go over the structures. So in, in, in looking at any kind of downstream scenario, any kind of real estate that might be of value, whether it is uh, urban area or, um, or earthen tank, um, or, or whatever might be downstream, uh, you, you know, you'd have to put a lot more consideration into the construction of the structures so that there, you know, wasn't a disastrous uh, episode. But, um, and so that, you know, in that case, we had engineers come in and help to, to, to secure the, 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 the calculations so that the structures wouldn't fail. Um, so that, you know, is, is an option if you've got earthen tanks downstream that you're worried about putting structures in upstream, certainly, um, you know, you, you'd wanna be very careful about that. The, the structures really are designed um, in, in a lot of cases to fail. Of course, beaver dams fail and, and we, we want to have some flooding events occurring in, in our systems because it's beneficial to the environment for that to happen. But even in the case of those very large structures at San Bernardino, when we saw that uh, thousand year event come through with Hurricane Odile, the structures collapsed but we saw on the ground the impacts of a hundred year event. So they decreased those, those, those extreme flood hazards of a thousand year event to, to down to a hundred year event on the ground. And, and the structures did uh, retain some sediment and vegetation despite some of the failures. So, so maybe failure is, is a relative term in that case. Thanks, Laura. Tess, yeah, do you um, go for it? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't have too much to add to that. Um, yeah, the, so uh, yeah, the, the work that we do is we don't really work upstream of, we don't have any issues like that that we really need to consider. Mostly we're working with, um, you know, in channel flows that are flowing into another channel. 
Um, one thing that I, I kind of would say is, if, I mean, of course, it depends on your on your context and what is going on. But um, one thing about these, and this kind of, Laura was kind of getting at this too, uh, but one thing um, about these dams that, you know, we put, we put, as I said, you know, tens, hundreds of these in an area. Um, and if they do, you know, some of them fail, some of them break, um, it's really not the end of the world. And a lot of times, you know, sometimes we'll go back and repair them. Sometimes we won't um, because, um, you know, ultimately we, the water is, um, we're not trying, as I said, you know, we're not trying to replicate a specific state, but to restore that flow. And if the flow, you know, um, wants to take down a dam and the, you know, 10 more downstream are there to, to pick up the slack, that's, um, it, it's still uh, very functional. So I guess what I'm what I'm kind of trying to get at is if there's uh, one thing that like about this smaller scale approach is that we're not putting all of our kind of all of our eggs in one basket. Like we're not relying so much on the success of one dam. Um, whereas you know you you do that more with with things like gabions or larger scale interventions where you have fewer of them. Um, so I guess yeah. It, it's, contextual obviously and maybe this this doesn't make sense for the the situation you're asking about but if you can you know um put in a number of dams or a number of structures um so that if if one fails or if a couple fail you know it's not going to be catastrophic um that that's one um that's one thing that we think about a lot Thanks, Tess. That's a really good good point not rely yeah having that sort of positive redundancy in a system. Um, yeah, I think um, moving from implementation towards maintenance, um, I'd love to hear a little bit. You were you were just talking about that test, and maybe you can you can be the first one to grab this, and then Laura and, and anyone else can jump onto that afterwards. But um, do you have any? Yeah, I think that people had a lot of questions regarded re regarding maintenance, and I think some of the specific ones that I picked up on were the frequency of maintenance how often these structures fail. And maybe this wasn't uh, asked specifically, but if there's an optimal time, like I've heard after that first uh, large rain event after implementation, it's, it can be especially important to go revisit those structures. Um, but anything anything that you have, uh, Tess and then Laura, about sort of lessons learned uh, in regard to maintenance would be helpful. And I think uh, if you can focus as well just on the costs of maintenance, that would be great. Oh, sure, yeah. So. So with these small scale structures, another thing about these is that they they don't really require maintenance. Um, and this is good for us because of how our funding works. Uh, because, you know, well, as I mentioned, we're mostly grant funded, um, some contracts in there too. But we get these projects that are, you know, one year, two year, three year in length. Um, and then we may not come back to the landscape to work there again. Um, so we really, you know, want to put interventions in place that don't require ongoing maintenance, which again is something that um, you do require with, with these larger scale, more heavily engineered structures like gabions. And that's not to say that, you know, that gabions, they're not appropriate or not good because they, they definitely are in certain circumstances, but maintenance is a much bigger consideration for something like gabions because those really do require ongoing maintenance. Um, to, to function, um, whereas uh, with these dams, yeah, if, if a couple blow out uh, or fail, it's really not the end of the world. Um, and in terms of how often they fail, um, it depends on the project, but I would say for our structures, maybe one in 15 or so. Um, and yeah, like I said, sometimes we repair them, sometimes we don't. Um, we'll typically repair them if it's, we'll typically repair them if there's, if basically if we're seeing erosion caused by that. So that would typically occur on the bank uh, edges where the structure meets the bank. Those are sort of weak points in the dam because that's where they're, they're connected into the ground. And if that's not stable uh, or, or that connection isn't great, sometimes you can get erosion that starts to eat out the sides. In that case, we'll definitely go back in if, you know, we have the chance to check on them um, and we'll put in um, another rock or two and really, really stabilize them. Um, let's see, if there's another part to that question. Um, Just cost was the last thing, I think, when, oh, maybe when planning yeah. or budgeting. 
sure. Yeah. So, um, cost is kind of, uh, it's kind of, yeah, cost is kind of funny. Um, uh, for us, we, I mean, gosh, it really depends on the project. Um, and kind of the, just how the landscape is laid out, how the structures are laid out. But maintenance is really, I mean, it's pretty, I'll, I'll just give you an idea. So, like, uh, we have our project at T4 Ranch, which I mentioned briefly. We have, uh, I think, about 400 structures we've built in the past couple of years that we've we've been built. We've continued to build, and we're checking the ones that, uh, you know, we keep checking. And we check after. Yeah, that was a good question about when do you, you know, when is maintenance good? And we typically check them after monsoon season um, and see how things are going but um yeah in terms of cost like so the crew and i walked one of our drainages that had 123 structures we walked that last week um and we repaired all the structures that needed to be repaired there um so you know uh in one day so that was see, there were four of us that day um and it took us a day to repair essentially 125 structures uh, 123 actually, I think it was. Um, but yeah, so cost, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's, uh, I, I don't know, hopefully that, that helps. I don't really have a dollar amount, but no, I guess that's, about if you're, uh, if you, that's okay. really, that's really helpful. And I think that's sometimes more than a dollar amount, the, the amount of people hours is actually sometimes a better uh -huh. metric. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Laura, do you have anything to add around maintenance? No, that, that was that was really great. The only thing I could add is that for those larger structures, um, you know, in 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 areas where structures are getting put in for for flood detention, in the past we had uh, suggested to clean out the sediment from behind the structure so that they could maintain their capability to withhold that flood. But um, you know, in in areas where habitat restoration is is a focus like at Cuenca los Ojos in San Bernardino, uh, they just build on top, uh, you know, so so once a structure gets filled in, th then you just start building on top. And that's exactly what the beavers do as well. So, you know, once the structures get to capacity, and they're doing everything that you want, they're holding the soil, they're holding this, this, the water back, then then start creating that stepped um, that stepped pool up above it. So that's just another option. Although I have no ideas about cost to share with anyone. Thanks, Laura. I, I would um, say that it would be beneficial for the, the land manager or the land owner to have some um, stewardship uh, built in for, for maintenance. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, Great. I think maybe I'm just keeping an eye on the time. It's 3.20 and I know we, uh, or I'm, I'm a few hours ahead. It's 20. Uh, we said we'd end, I think, at 15. Um, so maybe we'll ask a couple, just a couple more questions, one or two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Todd asked a quick question, and maybe we can just keep this one to, to a few answers. Maybe a couple people can jump in about um, how many people days it takes to implement uh, some of these projects. So maybe Tess, that could be a, a question for you if you've got a couple off the cuff, you know, this many days, this many people, this many structures, kind of a kind of a question just to give people a ballpark idea. Yeah, for sure. So let's see. Um, I have a crew, when we're the full crew, there are five of us. And we, um, I mean, it really, again, you know, it's contextual. It depends on the width of the drainage. Obviously, wider drainages, it takes longer to build a structure because they can be two, three times as large as smaller drainages. But um, the five of us, typically, we can build between like 15 and 20 structures in a day. Um, it can be less than that. It can be more than that. But that's probably about 15 to 20 um, that being said, um, the crew uh, that, that I have is, has done a lot of these, <laughs> so right. they're very, you know, it does take, it does take a little bit um, of time to get, um, you know, to, to get, get just efficient at figuring out with how to lay the rocks and how, how to put them in, but um, honestly, um, it's not, one, building one rock dams is very low tech, you can really learn to build one, uh, you know, pretty in just a couple hours um and um yeah so that's typically so i guess like uh for our crew one person builds maybe three to four in a given eight hour day and that also includes things like drive time and stuff like that 
Thanks. And Laura, I saw your, um, you just added, put, put something in the chat about a dollar estimate from a newsletter, and I'll make sure to circulate that to folks. Um, there are, I, I just want to recognize that there have been a lot of great questions about regulation that we haven't managed to get to and some other ones. We'll try to answer those afterwards and send them out in a post webinar little um, summary that we'll put together. And I think I just wanted to end on this last question about the impact and specifically maybe um, impact in terms of the, the lift for specific species of these uh, structures or of these retention dams. And I know this is a huge question and a complex one, but I know that a lot of people are trying to um, quantify or justify the sort the, the 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 benefit to specific species of uh, erosion control structures. And Tess, we we just finished a, a, a case study that we wrote about your work for, for Montezuma quail and, and where you used some of these rock detention structures or, or what the, the, the NIDS or how, whatever acronym we, we choose to call them. But um, yeah, maybe just a couple comments from, from you, from Laura, from anyone else about, um, yeah, quantifying those, the, the lift for species of, of these sort of implementations. Yeah, that is, that's a tricky question. And that's really hard. Um, that's something that's very hard to measure, you know, is how these structures are performing um, for specific species. Um, I mean, it's really hard to measure how these structures are performing in general, just due to the fact that they're, you know, they're not in a lab situation. We don't, we can't isolate them. They're by design, they're part of these very complex, very dynamic systems that they're, they're you know, interacting with. So it's really hard to kind of tease out, um, you know, the exact impacts of them, which is one reason that, uh, like, us at BRN are thrilled with what Laura Norman is doing, um, because it is really hard to, to you know, put uh, put numbers on um, on the impact of these structures. And, and she's been able to do that, which, you know, really um, validifies our work, um, or validates, rather. Um, but, um, yeah, so we do, I mean, we do have some, some projects that target certain species. The Montezuma quail is a, a, a kind of prime example. Um, so Montezuma quail, for instance, they rely on, uh, they have a lot of food plants that um, that rely on shallow groundwater or, or moist soils to germinate. Um, and uh, so these structures, we use these structures to, um, you know, trap water, infiltrate water, um, and then we're able to um, put out some of these Montezuma quail food species. In particular, we're working on some wood sorrel plots out of our native plant nursery. Um, and when those are all set, we'll, we'll start out planting them in some, some of these Montezuma quail habitat restoration projects. Um, but I, I, uh, I guess for me, like I, it's hard, it's hard to, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to focus on a specific species um, because it's more about at least in, kind of in my head, it's more about, um, you know, this, this broader restoration goal, these broader efforts. Um, but if, I mean, if there is, you definitely can tailor um, this work to specific species. As I said, the Montezuma quail is, is the main one that we've worked with. But if there is, you know, a specific species of interest that you're trying to restore habitat for, something like that, you know, again, Laura was saying, you know, it's important to identify your goals. Again, you just think about, you know, the goals and what, um, what are you trying to do, uh, what species you're trying, what the species need to survive that you're trying to, um, you know, provide habitat for. Um, yeah, that wasn't, I don't feel like that was a very good answer, but uh, maybe Laura has something better to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Um, I, I was just going to say that at San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge, you know, they were installed uh, to try to recreate native fish habitats. So, um, you know, looking at at the, the fish that they were able to bring back there, uh, the yucky um, catfish, maybe the, some of the some of the fishes there. There's macro uh, invertebrate uh, studies that have been done. Um, the greater sage grouse is is kind of a famous example of of restoration habitat um, that the Nature Conservancy has done. Um, and uh, Columbia spotted frogs have also uh, increased where uh, beaver dams and analogs, as as well as uh, steelhead. Uh, trout so so there's there's some there are some studies related to the beaver dam analogs that that could be referenced for those types of needs 
Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Thanks everyone for sticking with us uh, for for an extra ten minutes or so after the after the time we said we'd be done. We really appreciate y'all sticking around. Thank you so much, Laura and Tess, for for sticking around for the extra questions for your amazing presentation. Um, really, truly appreciate this. We see this as as the beginning of maybe a, a, a small series. We'll definitely be following up on, there seems to be a lot of interest on, on erosion control structures in these ephemeral drainages. Um, Anna just posted some contact information for myself, for Anna, for Christy. So that's the CCAS team. If you have any comments, questions, things you'd like to see in the future, feel free to email us, get in touch with us about anything you wanna, any, any specific questions or any specific follow-ups. Um, CCAST is really sees ourselves as supporting this sort of landscape conservation work. And where there is a need, we try to provide that collaboration or that communication um, amongst the people who are interested in it and, and provide some of the tools and resources that are needed. So if you have any specific ideas, any specific help you're looking for, please do get in touch. That's what we're here for. Um, as I conclude, I'm trying to remember if there's anything I'm forgetting. Um, yeah, just remember to check out some of the, the case study library that CCAST has. We have a ton of great resources about erosion control, these specific projects where um, these sort of uh, techniques have been used. There's contact information in those case studies, and they're a great way to connect with people who've done this successfully. Um, and that might be really the best way to learn more. Uh, Anna just posted a, a link to some of those, those, pres those case studies in the chat. Um, and I'll pass it back to you. Anything I'm, I'm forgetting? No, that's great. Laura, Tess, any final words? No. No, thank you. I, I did I did put in there that the structures, there was another question about um, downstream neighbors. And I just want to say that the structures are, are de detaining water and slowing it down, but not retaining it. So uh, I just wanted to, to put that in there. Thank you, Laura. That's a great clarification. Well, thanks, everyone. And with that, I'll, I'll let you all go. And uh, we'll follow up with the recording and, and a little summary of this presentation and discussion afterwards. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.